Good morning, welcome to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Today we are going to be reflecting on God's liberation. Liberation both for those who are oppressed and for the oppressor too. We'll start with singing number 193, Out of My Bondage, Sorrow and Night.
Let's begin with prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, we come to you. We come to you just as we are, to give you thanks and praise for bringing us here, for bringing us out of bondage, out of the traps of despair we have found ourselves in. For some, you have freed us from chains of bad habits. For some, you have freed us from the chains of bad thoughts. You have taken us out of guilt and shame. You've called us loved, and you have welcomed us into your kingdom. We praise you for the freedom you bring and promise to all people. For we confess, O oh God, that although we have lived in this freedom, we have not always been uh, kind and caring for each other. Although we have been freed, there are ways that we have oppressed and hurt those around us. Forgive us for those times when we have been uh, uh, ill-tempered and difficult with those we love. Forgive us for times when we have failed to help our neighbor in need. Forgive us for ways that we are complicit in a society that has harmed others. In our worship today, inspire us again with this promise of a new kingdom, a kingdom where all will be freed, where no one will be hurt, where every tear will be wiped away. May we do our part to make your kingdom here on earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I said at the beginning of this year that I wanted to make a, a more intentional effort of introducing you to different theologians. Uh, and about two weeks ago, uh, one theologian who's been an influence on me had passed away at the age of 85. Her name was Rosemary Radford Ruther. Uh, I say she's been very influential on me, although I've never read any of her works. So when I heard that she died, I was like, oh, I got to pick up some of her books. I happen to have two of them at home. Oh, I've skipped too far ahead. One of them is this. It's entitled Sexism and God Talk Towards a Feminist Theology. Rosemary Radford Ruther was a feminist, what we call a feminist liberation theologian. She started out uh, in the 60s writing about... Uh, First, about anti-Semitism and the church. She's very concerned about anti-Semitism. And she says that like some people will just assume that she must have Jewish connections or a family member, maybe she's Jewish. And she says, no, no, it's not that. She has no connections. But she feels that after the Holocaust, it's the responsibility of every Christian to wrestle very deeply with the anti-Semitism that she says is rooted in our tradition and past. And that anti-Semitism is always going to be part of our tradition. It's always part of our history. And it's our responsibility to be constantly weeding it out every time it pops its head up. She was concerned about the ways that the church continued to oppress Jewish people right up into the 20th century. She then got very involved in uh, the civil rights movement and she went to Mississippi. She helped out with some of the civil rights activism uh, there. And then she was hired at Howard University, a historically black university, and she got very involved in uh, working towards ending racism within the church. This is back in the 60s. This woman was amazing. And from that perspective, she then goes and turns to the issue of sexism in the church as well. Her general theme 
was that we have ways that we continue to participate in oppressing and hurting others. And it's our responsibilities to recognize those ways and to work to bring a new world, a new uh, kingdom, where all people are going to be free. I flashed this for uh, just a moment ago. Uh, she, in this book, uh, tries to talk about uh, ways that feminism can influence and should influence our theology. Uh, as I was reading it, I kept thinking, oh, this is standard. I've heard all this sort of stuff before. Uh, and that's because she wrote the standard. <laughs> this is, uh, her work has gone on to influence a lot of the ways we talk about feminism in the church today. And she recognized that we've had a history, the scripture is written in patriarchal societies. And so it's gonna be influenced by that misogyny. And our own images of God go our default masculine images. Uh, she says that some have tried to then say, uh, swing the other way and try to use feminine imagery for God, talk about mother God, and that's one approach you can take. But the problem, she says, is uh, we are still participating in a hierarchical system where we're trying to set one above the other. And that doesn't work when we talk about anti-Semitism, that doesn't work with racism, doesn't work with sexism. It's not that we can replace the oppressed and make them the new oppressors. We need to end the whole system of oppression. So she suggests in this book, it never caught on, but a new uh, way of talking about God. And she uses this term here that is intentionally unpronounceable. The slash needs to be there. You can't say goddess, because then you'll just think feminine. Uh, and you can't just say God slash S, that doesn't work. It's just meant to be unpronounceable. Uh, but it's her way of trying to encompass the, the bigness of God, the way that God is beyond all gender. What I liked most about her was the way she presented Jesus's promise of the new kingdom of God. And she points out how the work of Jesus wasn't uh, just to uh, involve women in his ministry, he did lots of that, but to challenge his whole society and to say that we're not living in a system or we need a God's system is not patriarchal, not hierarchical, but a place where all people are equal. One example of that is Jesus' use of the word Abba. Uh, you may have heard that Abba is, means uh, daddy. It's a, in term of affection for dad. Uh, daddy doesn't quite encompass it, she says. It's uh, more childlike than, than that. Uh, but Jesus, is, Jesus pushes God as the image of an intimate, close uh, daddy as a way of challenging the family systems of his time. So he says, you leave your mother and father, you hate your father and mother, and join in this new family of God, where there isn't between us, mom and dad and that hierarchical family structure, but where we are all equally children of God. In the same way, in his promise of being the Messiah, it's not so that he can set up new kings to rule over people. It's so that we can all accept God as our king. That we are all equal subjects. Now the church quickly got back into patterns of hierarchy and power and control. It's inevitable we're human. But Ruth, Rad, Rosemary Radford Ruther calls us back to that first vision, a vision of true equality between races and classes and gender. So she's going to be, I'm not going to mention her again in the sermon, but she does influence, as you know, uh, the things I will be talking about later in our worship. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 664, the first one ever. Uh, we don't, we've sung this one before, but we've not done it very often. I think it uh, helps to, if you think of it as a sea shanty. It's kind of a sea shanty tune.
have a reading from Psalm 97. Rejoiced, let the many coastlands be f- glad. Fire goes before the Lord and consumes enemies on every side. Mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. Images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. All gods bow down before the Lord. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. those who hate evil, guards the lives of the faithful, and rescues them from the hand of the wicked. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous. reading from Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 34. With Paul and Silas, we came to Philippi in Macedonia, a Roman colony, and as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, These men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful to us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them on the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. 
But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. When he brought them outside, then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his household. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. The word of the Lord. God brings our liberation. God liberates us. Liberates us from systems of oppression that we didn't even realize we were participating in. It is the nature of oppression that we only see it when we are the ones being oppressed. We see our own struggles. Those are generally obvious. But it takes a huge leap of compassion to see the oppression of others, to imaginatively place ourselves in their shoes, particularly if they are being oppressed by systems that benefit us. Oppressors never think of themselves as oppressors. Neither the pharaohs of Egypt nor the plantation owners of the New World thought that they were doing anything wrong. In 2004, I spent a month in Ghana, and as part of that trip, we visited one of the forts along the coast. It's a place that they had taken slaves from across West Africa, and they put them on boats. Uh, First, the fort was built by the Portuguese Catholics, and then operated by Reformed Protestants. That's our tradition. It's just a simple square fort. The basement was, in every sense, a dungeon cold, wet, and dark. That is where Africans would be held until they could be loaded onto the ships. Directly above that dungeon was the main floor of the fort on which they built a chapel. Just a thin stone floor separated them with some air vents between the stones. It makes you wonder how Christians could sing hymns in that chapel while hearing the cries of women, children, and men in the dungeon below them. How could they participate in such evil and oppression? The reality is, those oppressors, those slave owners, didn't think they were doing anything wrong. That's a terrifying realization. And you might struggle against it. How could they not think that what they were doing was evil, you ask? To us, it's such an obvious crime against humanity, especially as Christians. They must have, on some level, understood the horror of it. Yet that's precisely why they couldn't see it. It's too horrifying. If they could really see the terrible things they were doing, if they could really understand, it would cause a psychological collapse. So they instinctually block out the horror. Their minds find ways to excuse it and to defend it. It's the same way that average German soldiers, average normal people like you and I, participated in the concentration camps of Auschwitz. They were told that Jews were not human, and desperate for a way to wrap their minds around this terror, they accepted that rationale. This is baffling to us, because we're looking at it from the outside. But when you are in that system, in that society, it's a lot harder to see how your actions are hurting and oppressing others. Even if you get glimpses of it, your mind shuts it down. It will instinctually find a rationale that excuses you. It's a survival instinct, because oppressors are just as caught in these systems 
as the people that they oppress. We see a terrible example of this playing out in the issue of guns in the United States. The rest of the world looks on in disbelief. How could assault rifles be legal for an average citizen to own? To us, looking in from the outside, this is baffling. The number of mass shootings is incomprehensible. The trauma inflicted on children is horrifying. The National Rifle Association is directly responsible for the proliferation of assault rifles in the United States. Yet no member of the NRA would ever think of themselves as being part of the problem. They all think they're the good guys. They sincerely think that. They sincerely believe that we'd be better off if every good guy carried a gun. The connection between the gun that they own and the horror of what guns have done is too great, too much for one mind to comprehend, so as a way of mentally, emotionally washing the blood off their hands, they turn to increasingly elaborate arguments about the Second Amendment or about arming teachers. To preserve their psyche, they entrench themselves in these excuses and they won't be budged. Reason and logic and all the research on gun control from around the world will never convince them. I would say that they're incapable of seeing themselves as part of the problem. Oppressors will never see themselves as oppressors. Which is a scary thought for us. Could we be oppressors now and not realize it? Is our behavior, our lifestyle, hurting or exploiting others? Would we know if it was? The majority of teachers in the residential schools thought they were doing a good thing. They were obvious abuse and crimes. Some things were just clearly evil. But the average teacher didn't do those things. The average teacher thought that they were helping. They accepted society's argument that these children were better off in boarding homes, better off being assimilated into white Canadian culture. They didn't think of what they were doing as oppressive. They thought they were saviors. Now, I'm not excusing them. Everything about the residential school system was terrible. But I'm highlighting how easy it is to get wrapped up in a system of oppression, to find yourself oppressing others without even realizing you're doing it. We are often blind to the ways we oppress. Which takes me to the example of Paul in our reading from Acts. I'm going to say some critical things about Paul, and I know that that can be upsetting and distracting, so let me start by saying how much I love the Apostle Paul. I think he's fantastic and did amazing work. God did wonderful things through him. But he was human. He's not our savior, and he was not perfect. In today's story, Paul and Silas are in Philippi, uh, followed by this slave girl who is crying out, those men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. After several days of this, Paul gets annoyed and says, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. The spirit leaves her, and this eventually results in Paul being imprisoned. Because I've been reading Rosemary Radford Ruther, I focused more this week on the slave girl. I wondered who she was. What's her story? Why was she following Paul and Silas around? And what happened to her after? I was even wondering was she really possessed by an evil spirit? In the NRS version of the Bible that we read, it says that she had a spirit of divination. That's not necessarily an evil spirit. We talk about having a spirit of gentleness, a spirit of kindness, a spirit of love. These aren't separate 
spiritual entities. If Paul had met this girl in the context of church, he would have said she has a spirit of prophecy. In the original Greek, she's described as having a Pythian spirit, which is a reference to oracles and prophecy. Traditionally, we've interpreted this to be an evil spirit, but that's not the only way to read it. The other very curious thing is that she's proclaiming the word of God. She's literally doing what Paul instructs his followers of Christ to do. Tell the world about God's salvation. What's evil about that? If this is an evil spirit, it's a spirit that's bad at being evil. And then Paul casts out the spirit, not because he thought it was evil, but because he got annoyed. If it was an evil spirit, why was he ignoring it for several days? It's all very odd. In the NRSV, it says that Paul turned and said to the spirit, but that part in Greek too can be translated as Paul turned and said in the spirit. In the Holy Spirit, he said, so this too opens up the possibility that maybe she wasn't demon-possessed. It's all speculation on my end. I'm just raising questions and possibilities. Whether she was demon-possessed or not, the Spirit of God, through Paul, liberated her. She was being used by the slave owners to make prophecies. Whether she was possessed or not, she was being forced to make these prophecies. Whatever the situation was, this is a traumatized and abused little girl being exploited by charlatan owners. She sees Paul and Silas, and there's something about them. There's something in the message that they're sharing that inspires her with hope. She uses this excuse of prophesying as a way to follow them around and cry out for help. She heard the message of God's freedom being preached by Paul, and now she is crying out to be freed. It saddens me that it took Paul several days to hear her cry. He walked around and ignored her. For days she had to get louder and louder before he took notice. And then, he wasn't going to help her just because she was a slave. He yelled at her because he got annoyed. He cast out the demon, not for her sake, but for his own benefit. Paul couldn't see her, because as a man and a Roman citizen, he's complicit in the systems that oppressed her. Paul preached this message of liberation, a message that in the kingdom of God there would be no slaves or masters. And yet, he couldn't envision uh, that equality happening in his own world, in his own lifetime. He knew that in Christ all slaves are free, and yet he still sent slaves back to their masters and told them to be good slaves. Now, the message of God was clearly within him, and yet it was a message that went beyond his own imagination. The same goes for the role of women. It's Paul who said that there is no male or female in the kingdom of God. It's Paul who elevated women like Lydia to work in the mission of God. And yet, it's also Paul who told women to cover their heads in church and to be quiet. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul got a vision of what the kingdom would look like, but he still struggled with implementing that vision. He was trapped himself in a patriarchal slave-owning culture and couldn't see the full evils of that society. To see the horrible things that society did to slaves and women meant acknowledging how he benefited from those horrible things. That jarred against his image of himself as a decent, normal human being. He couldn't see himself as an oppressor. But that doesn't stop the Spirit of God from working through him. 
God uses Paul, admittedly a slave of the Most High, to liberate this girl. It was God's actions, combined with her own determination, that freed her from a life of prophesying for her masters. Paul might have overlooked her, but God didn't. Paul thought he was in control this whole time, but God makes clear that the act of liberating, the power to liberate, comes from God. Paul gets arrested and there in prison, God makes obvious who is doing the saving here. God breaks chains. God flings open the jail door. God breaks chains not just from the prisons we know we are in, but also from the prisons we don't even see. God brings freedom to Paul, but also freedom to the people that Paul oppressed. God breaks not just the chains, but the whole system of oppression. Paul and Silas, they don't even realize what they're doing. They don't see how they as men benefit from patriarchy. They wouldn't even think that women need saving. But that doesn't stop the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will free this girl and in time will free all women. The Holy Spirit is at work in the world, working through the church, through you and I, in ways that we don't even see. The Spirit is proclaiming a vision of liberation, a kingdom of peace that goes beyond our imaginations. God will tear down systems of oppression that we are all trapped in bringing freedom not just for the prisoner, but for the jailer too. You and I are a part of a system of oppression. We know that our society is hurting people, that our planet itself is hurting because of our lifestyles. We benefit from the exploitation of others. We don't think about it too deeply, Our minds quickly distract us with other thoughts, but we don't, so we don't know the details, but in our hearts, we know it's true. But don't despair. Even though we can't see it, God sees it. Even if we can't imagine a way to stop it, God does. Even if we are entrenched, In backward ideas about the world, it's God who's going to turn the world upside down, right side up. God can free us from oppression and from oppressing. So trust in God. Let yourself be freed by God and work towards God's kingdom of liberation where all will be equal and no one oppressed. Amen. I invite you to stand, if you're able, as we respond together to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Um, We'll sing now number 352, And Can It Be That I Should Gain?
rejoicing in the freedom and liberation of God bring to give a token of our thanks and praise. Your offering can be received as you leave at the offering place at the back or paid uh, online. For our prayers of the people today, we have a prayer request for Alita's uh, nephew, Chris. Uh, he's in a medically induced uh, coma. He's had uh, recently a heart transplant. And, uh, prayers, of course, for Baldy uh, in Texas, and then one affected there. For uh, uh, prayers for health, pain, family relationships, a uh, special prayer today for cats, and yes, we have international cats day, so we'll be praying for all our cats. So, any other prayer requests? Lord God, we give thanks and praise that you free each of us, but also all people who have experienced oppression. You will free the factory workers who produce our clothing. You will free freedom, the promise of a kingdom where all will be equal. May this church be a place where that kingdom of equality is uh, felt and seen. May your church around the world repent of ways that we have hurt others and seek ways to bring peace and healing and freedom. We pray today for Uvalde, Texas for all the families who are in the midst of shock and grief right now, for an entire country and world that is triggered and traumatized by these news events. We hear it so often that we might become numb to these things, so we pray that you keep us compassionate, keep our hearts open, even if it is pain. We pray for the people of Ukraine that there will be peace and an end to the warfare. We pray for our own family relationships, for peace within our relationships, for those we know and love who are dealing with uh, health issues. We pray for this. Granddaughters, and we pray for Alita's cousin, uh, nephew Chris, that his body will accept the heart transplant and that he will emerge from the coma. We pray for all of those we know who are in the hospital right now or in continuing care situations. Bring them healing and Today, we give thanks for your many blessings in our lives, for the blessing of sunshine in sunny days, and for the pet in our homes. We give special thanks today for the gift of pets. Listen to pray in the name of your son. Amen. Main announcement today is that we have the garage sale coming up. It's going to be this weekend. Uh, stuff has already started to be sorted, uh, but there's still uh, lots to be done. So if you are able to come on weekdays after six, uh, at 6 p.m., uh, you can help us sort through things. Also going to be able to sell things on uh, at the garage sale. So garage sale is going to be Friday starting at 4 p.m. and Saturday starting at 10 a.m. So any help that we can get, we appreciate it. Please pass the word on that this is a great car sale with lots and lots of fines. So uh, let everyone know to come check it out. Are there any other announcements today? Our final hint is number uh, 490, God of Grace and God of Grace.
See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying will be no more, for the first things have passed away. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.